Uh, the September 17th meeting of the Planning Board is now in session. First item is the approval of the minutes. Are there any comments or corrections? Do I have a motion? I move we uh, approve the minutes of the August 20, 2019 meeting as submitted. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Second item is the Planning Board will hold an executive session for consultation with its attorney concerning Christopher Munns and Julie Munns versus the town of Cape Elizabeth and Margaret Burlam and Noel DeLuca under Title I, Chapter 13, Public Records and Proceedings, Section 4056E, State of Maine Statutes. Uh, do I have a motion to go into executive session? I move we go into executive session. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. So we will retire to an executive session now.
I'd like to make a motion to take us out of executive session. Motion to exit executive session. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. So before we begin, there's just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, Dan uh, was not present at the first, um, when we went through this application, and so we're just gonna have Dan state the uh, preparation that he went through to uh, get ready for tonight. Right. So I've reviewed the report, the application, the drawings, and I've watched the video. And, and that's basically, so I, I, I reviewed the information. Okay, and does Point of order, I just wasn't sure if the chair actually properly introduced the next item, the Munns versus Town Cables. Yes, okay. Next item is Munns versus the Town of Cape Elizabeth, Burlam, DeLuca, Remand. The planning board will reopen the hearing and proceedings at the direction of the Superior Court on the application of Maggie Burlam and Noel DeLuca for a private road review to establish frontage for a lot located at 8 Astor Lane, U49-42, section 1979, private road review. Thank you, John. Um, and so does anyone have an issue with Dan on this? I do not. Okay, and then Andrew? Um, I just need to state again, as I've stated previously, that I live in the neighborhood of the applicant and I, I don't abut the applicant at all. I'm not actually even in sight of it. Uh, I do feel like I can be impartial on this subject, so. Does anybody have an issue? No issue. No. Okay. I'm fine. Great. So next I'm going to introduce our town attorney, John Wall, who's going to give us uh, background information on the remand. Thank you all. Um, as you alluded to, uh, this matter was previously um, the subject of a hearing and a, a vote by the board on an application for a private road. Um, that decision was appealed to the Superior Court. As a result of that appeal, uh, the Superior Court um, issued basically two orders. One was um, affirming a part and um, uh, remanding the determination made by the planning board. Uh, the remand had two specific items, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, after seeking further clarification from the Superior Court as to the scope of the remand, the Superior Court uh, entered a second order vacating the first decision by the board and remanding for further proceedings, including the um, uh, taking of additional evidence if necessary in order to resolve uh, the issues on remand. Um, so currently what the board will be considering is essentially the application at the end of the process, the application uh, on an up or down vote uh, the way it did the first time uh, with particular emphasis on addressing two issues on remand identified by the Superior Court. Um, in going through that process, it's my opinion that the board can consider all the information that's been previously submitted to the board as part of the application process. Uh, that was the subject of the, of the prior vote. Um, in addition, the, there's some additional information that can be submitted either in documents or through uh, uh, the public hearing today that the board may consider. The two specific issues from the remand are as follows. Uh, for the board to make a determination whether the, the private access way and by that they're referring to the private access way claimed by um, uh, the, the Munces is valid, and if so, whether the private access way and maintenance agreement should be considered under the application. And of course, that's the application for the private road. Um, in um, addressing those two points, um, uh, as I said, the board can take additional information and um, I believe um, at, again at the end of the process, it'll be up to the board to make an, uh, a complete up or down vote on the application while addressing those two points. Uh, I don't know if there's anything in, in addition you would like me to address and to sort of set this up. 
Does anybody have any? Um, so I guess I'll wait. Okay. Okay, um, so we'll now open the meeting to public session. And um, first up will be uh, the Berlin DeLucas, and you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, my name is Scott Anderson. I'm a, a lawyer at Beryl Dana uh, in Portland, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Maggie and Noel um, to talk to you about the issues that have been identified uh, by John for this remand proceeding. Um, you know, on the uh, John's right that the Superior Court vacated the opinion, um, and so, but I'm going to limit my comments to those two questions that were sent to you from the Superior Court. One, is this private access way valid? And if it is valid, what effect, if any, um, um, does that have on the permitting decision that you made uh, last May uh, on behalf of uh, Maggie and Noel for their application? Other than that, my understanding is, is essentially the record as you go through this round two contains everything that Maggie and Noel had given you previously, and um, we're not going to be adding to any of that. We all think that was sufficient. Um, I, I think um, although this has been sent back to you, it's important to note that when the court looked at your prior decision, there were a bunch of issues we covered, but the court found that your permitting decision was proper and was supported by evidence on all of the standards that a applied to the private roads. So the things like the traffic standards and the stormwater issues and the waivers and everything was granted. Um, although you'll be going through that process again, the court had found that you had done that properly the first time. So again, we're gonna focus just on the two questions. The other issue just to point out, um, I think is, this issue about the gate is not really before you either. Um, that issue came up during the last board proceeding. You mentioned it in the permitting decision. We all went up to the Superior Court, and the Superior Court judge said that what you did in the permitting decision with respect to the gate was supported by evidence. So I think we're really down to just the private access way, and I'm going to focus my comments on that. Um, I provided the board with some information, a narrative, and some documents, including an affidavit. I'm not going to go through all of those in great detail because I know you've reviewed them, but I just want to hit some of the highlights with regard to these two questions. Um, mostly I'm here uh, if you have questions. So as a lawyer, I can go and go and go, but um, please stop me at any point in time if you have any questions, and then certainly after I kind of run through a summary of what we've submitted. Um, I'm here to answer any questions the board may have. So the, co the first question the court wants you to answer is whether or not this private access way that was actually permitted by the planning board back in 2004 for the Ned Wells is valid. And we think that the, the clear and obvious answer to that is no, the private access way is not valid. Um, the ordinance is very clear, and it's been the same back in 2004 as it is today. When you obtain approval for a private access way from the planning board, you have to record both the road maintenance agreement and the plan showing the private access way within, uh, with the registry of deeds within 90 days. And the ordinance provides that if you don't do it within the 90 days, then the planning board's approval is null and void, which means your private access way is null and void. And actually, you have the original 2004 decision um, in the prior uh, permitting proceeding, and it, too, was very clear and instructed the Nedwells that if they didn't record both the road uh, management agreement and the plan by June 14th, 2004, then the planning board's approval would be void, and so would the private access agreement. So we went, I had my a real estate paralegal, Sharon Bowler, do a search of the registry of deeds. You have her affidavit and conclusions. This is her job. She's been doing it for decades. And she searched the registry, and there is no recorded plan for the Ned Wells permitted private access way back in 2004. They did record the road maintenance agreement, but the uh, ordinance is crystal clear. You have to record both the road maintenance agreement and the site plan to essentially perfect uh, your private access way. Um, and so on June 15th, 2004, 15 years ago, um, the, the Nedwell's private um, access way um, 
died, uh, was null and void, and um, has not been resurrected since that date. As the board knows, there's only one way to create a valid private access way, and that's you have to come to the planning board and obtain approval. Now, the Munzes have submitted documents, including a certificate of occupancy for the Ned Wells home, and made other allegations that statements that have been made by the town somehow have revived this private access way and made it valid again. Um, but the permits that were issued to the, uh, to the Ned Wells for their home we don't really know the circumstances. We don't know if the Ned Wells believed the plan had been recorded or knew it hadn't and pulled the permits anyway. But what we know is the plan was never recorded, so those permits probably sh shouldn't have been issued back in 2004, and they were. But just because the town issued permits for the development of that house, that does not revive the validity of the private access way. It just meant that the Ned Wells had a permit to build a house um, without the requisite frontage, and nobody caught it at the time. The other point that the Munzes have made is that early on in this proceeding, Ben McDougall had advised Maggie and Noel that they needed to come to you folks to essentially upgrade the road and make it a private road because the private access way that Ben thought was there could only serve the Munzes' home and couldn't serve more than two homes. Now, the reason why Ben thought there was a private access way is that's because the Munzes told him there was a private access way there. And Ben had assumed that the Nedwells had complied with the ordinance, which they didn't. And the real point that Ben was making to Maggie and Noel was, whatever's there, you can't use it. If there is a private access way there, the Munzes are already using it. You can't have two houses, so you have to do a private road if the private access way wasn't there, and it turns out it wasn't valid at that point in time, well, Maggie and Noel still had to come to you for a private road because that meant nothing was there. So when Ben was advising Maggie and Noel what to do and when permits were issued to the Ned Wells before, none of that, uh, okay, so am I under a timer? Yes. Okay, then I'm gonna speed up. Okay, I could finish up. So, Basically, um, none of these facts, none of the law uh, are disputed. Um, there is no valid uh, public access way because it expired back in 2004. The second question is, if it does exist, what effect is there? Um, there's uh, either no effect or a beneficial effect on the Munzes for two reasons. First, if you look at the 2004 planning board approval that authorized the private access way, there's nothing about that permitting decision that is inconsistent with the permit that was granted to Maggie and Noel. Um, it's not like there were terms and conditions that created conflict. So these two permitting decisions match up and there's no conflict. But more importantly, the construction of the private road that you authorized last year in the permit that we're all fighting about actually benefited the Munzes in several ways. First, it cured their frontage problem. The private access way was dead, but when Maggie and Noel built the private road, that provided the Munzes with frontage and resolved their legal issue. So it is, in fact, the case that the town's not going to go after the Munzes because they have perfectly legal frontage complements of Maggie and Noel. Second of all, um, the, the, the road has been improved. Private roads are a little standards are a little stricter than private access way. So this is a better road than, than what was there before when the Ned Wells constructed the house. So the Munzes have benefited from the improved road. And finally, the road maintenance agreement Prior to Maggie and Noel coming before you and obtaining that approval, the Munzes were 100% responsible for the maintenance of this area of South Street. After Maggie and Noel received the approval and they have their own road maintenance agreement, they are responsible for maintaining this. So what the Munzes used to be 100% responsible for, they now have shared costs. And in fact, the Munzes could do nothing and Maggie and Noel will still be required to maintain right, this. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up here. And so we think with respect to the second question, even if you found that the private access way existed, um, there is no adverse impact of your prior permitting decision and no impact whatsoever. Any of the other issues that have been raised are really private disputes that are really not properly before the board. So thank you very much for your time and attention and I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning that we were gonna time this. Uh, so since you took eight minutes, we'll give the Munz as attorney okay. eight minutes as well.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Peggy McGee with the law firm of Perkins Thompson, and I'm here with my clients, Julie and Chris Muntz, who are here in the audience. And I hope you received a copy of the letter uh, with its attachments uh, that we uh, submitted to the board on Thursday. Maureen advises that you have them. Uh, I, I am not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to uh, restate some of the points. Uh, one of the things is, uh, uh, John, if I may say, John Walt, your attorney, um, mentioned that the court had remanded this for you to consider two issues. One issue is, uh, is the valid private access way, which is, of course, what uh, uh, Chris and Julie were arguing to the board. Consider this is a private access way. Make a finding it's an access way. But the second issue was what they argued to the board last time. And we have a maintenance agreement. We have complete uh, responsibility and obligation to that. Um, and as part of that, we have a uh, right to put up a gate. This case is about the gate. And I hope you don't lose sight of that. Uh, with a, there, was, there was no mention of it um, by the applicants. Uh, it's because the gate was permitted to be taken down by this board in approving the, and then, uh, it was done, then it was taken down by the applicants. We tried to put it back up. They took it down again and then sued us. And um, because of the safety issue, and you know that your concern should be about safety, the safety of their child who wanders in the road without regard to through traffic, all that construction that's beyond on Astor Lane coming through, um, because of the safety, they were compelled to leave their home. I mean, this is not a minor matter. This is not a minor appeal. And you'll hear testimony from uh, Mr. Mons, Chris, um, that uh, they want the opportunity to get back to their home where they were married, you know, with here in, t in this town. Uh, so um, the few points that we want to make is I, we know that the applicants are saying to you, this is a, an invalid 15 years later. This is an invalid home. The, this is an invalid private access way. Um, and we're supposed to accept their say so. What they've done is submitted an affidavit from a paralegal who said, I couldn't find it. And uh, that is something, I guess, the absence could be something for you to consider. But we have submitted evidence from the code enforcement officer who submitted, who issued back in 2004 the certificate of occupancy and under the terms of the ordinance, it cannot be issued if there is any aspect of the approval that is not complied with. And there has been nothing said, not even today, the code enforcement officer submitted nothing to this board even today saying, oh, now that we have had this in litigation and this argument's made by the applicants, I find that it's not valid. The absence of the CEO saying anything like that is also evidence. What we have is uh, the code enforcement officer issuing something that indicates it's valid back in 2004, being taxed, being lived in, being conveyed to the Munces. And uh, so we, the evidence we have is most compelling comes from the town itself as to its validity. You do not need to accept the say-so of uh, the, uh, Mr. Anderson's paralegal, and she couldn't find it. So uh, the other point is that, yes, the judge asked you to consider evidence. You now have the evidence of the certificate of occupancy. But once you have that evidence from the code enforcement officer, you do not have the authority to overturn it. As you know, you don't have an authority to contradict the code enforcement officer saying we have an applicant who says it's invalid and therefore that's the evidence we're accepting. You are compelled to accept the, uh, the evidence of the code enforcement officer. And by the way, it was the, um, I, uh, we're, there was a representation to you that it was the Munces who said it was a private access way. No, it wasn't. It was the town that advised the applicants um, that uh, it was a private access way back in 2013. And so um, we, then you have uh, the, um, uh, the, the, I've got lost my thread here, uh, the code enforcement officer um, uh, not indicating anything other than this. And if the code enforcement officer has found it to be valid, 
and you have people living in this home, the only body in this town that can contradict that is the Zoning Board of Appeals under your own ordinance. It has, as the ordinance says, exclusive jurisdiction to contradict what the CEO says. So even if you found that you believe absolutely what the applicants are saying, it is not your call. It's not the applicant's call, and it's not your call. Once you have that evidence from the CEO, that's the evidence that shows it's a valid access way. What do we go, where do we go from there? There was one other thing that the court um, asked you to do. If it's a valid access way, if you have that evidence, then does this maintenance agreement that you've uh, had the applicants sign um, affect the month's maintenance agreement? That you're supposed to make a finding as well. Now, the town planner had told Mr. Muntz before the approval, their maintenance agreement's gonna affect yours. Uh, and, uh, and it does, because it gives the applicants the responsibility of maintaining the road, but also the right. So they're canceling out a prior right of an agreement that was drafted by this town back in 2004, which is recorded, we can find that one easily enough, in the registry and cross-references the site plan. So, uh, and so we, the, there's a finding for you to find that. And the other thing that we're asking you for is to say, unlike when, when the, the last hearing you had, no one told you that Maine law provides that you can, uh, private roads can have gates. And uh, for example, there is the case of Brown versus Connor, where the court said a private way may be secured by the property owners by gates and bars to lessen the hazard of unwarranted or casual intrusion on their property due to its being open to easy access from the main public highway. That's the main law court case. And then there's this other case of um, Hanneman, where the court said you can have a gate, goes up and down, even though a property owner objects. And one other piece of evidence that you didn't have um, at the last hearing, besides having that information, actually you were told the opposite, the law does allow the gates. The other one is that now the property owners on South Street and Stevenson Street have formed a road association by statute. And by statute, when they do that, they have the right to decide how to uh, regulate that private road as to liability, as to a maintenance, and they can gate it so that the public can't come up there, tear up the road, uh, and do the rest of it. That is what a private road is about. They have this right by law and now by statute to install the gate. So we are also asking you, we're not asking that the house be torn down. The applicants went ahead even though the, the approval was challenged and they built it. But we are asking that this board decline to, I'll finish my sentence, <laughs> decline uh, uh, to um, uh, approve or require uh, the gate to go down, to find that the town was correct in uh, uh, issuing the certificate of occupancy. It's a valid private access way, which is why this was brought to the board in the first place, and that the maintenance agreement uh, that were prior in time have the priority effect. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, having heard from both attorneys, we're gonna limit the remaining speakers to three minutes. You're not gonna give me my eight minutes? Come on. <laughs> Come on, Joseph, come on, you know, we've been friends now here. Uh, Chris Munns, uh, so you heard from my attorney. Uh, I'm a 15 year resident, uh, as uh, Peggy said, uh, not only did we live here for 15 years, we actually got married here. Uh, we had three wonderful boys uh, here. We were very involved in the schools. We had many friends. Uh, actually helped the town build the stands over at the high school was part of that committee um, and you know to be honest you know since this has all transpired and and have really in an essence gotten screwed um, you know by this that I've had to my wife and I've had to move we've had to uh, leave our house because of the safety of our children 
Um, but more importantly for my, my son, uh, Easton, who has uh, epilepsy, uh, who uh, has no sense of awareness of, of danger, uh, and that gate was very important. I wouldn't be standing here fighting this if I didn't feel it wasn't important, okay? I wouldn't have taken it this far if I didn't feel it was important and that you guys erred in your judgment, okay? We've had to move. We'd love to come back to this town. Like I said, we have tons of friends, um, but I, I can't risk the safety of my son because all it takes is one car. It's, not, it's minimal traffic, as they say, but all it takes is one car. And then we have a bigger problem on our hands. And it's not just my kids. There's other kids that live on that road as well. And you guys should take that into account uh, with your judgment on top of the fact that, uh, you know, if, if it wasn't a private access way, then why are we here? Why did we begin this in the first place? Thank you. Uh, Chris, can you give your address, please? Yeah, 5 South Street, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Okay, are there any other people who wish to speak? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Could I just respond just to the very brief to the one of the petty rages? Ultimately, this is No. No, we'll, we'll get you. I mean, we'll, we'll probably uh, the question will come up, I'm sure. Okay, so the public session is now closed. Um, does anybody on the board have questions for John? I don't have a question for John, I have a yes, comment. Okay. I'd like to clarify something, having reviewed the meeting from May of 2018, it was very clearly stated by our town planner that gates are not precluded on private roads and private access ways. They are not the purview of the town, and therefore it is not up to this board to decide whether a gate goes up, comes down. It is part of that road association's decision and not ours. But it cannot be on Astor Lane. It must be on the private, private road. It must be on South Street. And that was very clearly stated in the May 2018 meeting. Thank you. I, yeah, I just want to reiterate that because that was a point made over and over again is you can put a gate on a private road. As far as I can tell, there's no evidence that that gate was on a private road. The survey clearly shows it about 14 feet into the public right of way. And as far as anybody knows, no evidence has been brought to the contrary to show that that gate was on private on the private property side of the boundary line um, so John can I say something on that point yes and I do also recall that this board upon hearing information about that gate was that it was put up by the Cape Elizabeth Police Department and then taken down by the Cape Elizabeth Police Department uh, having nothing to do with what was presented to this board and the decisions that were made by this board. And even Justice Mills in her findings found that the gate was basically an issue um, that I think she described it as a, uh, an abandoned gate uh, in that regard. So I don't think that that is an issue that we uh, should be looking at. Um, yeah, I'd like to move on point. from the gate and really discuss the remand issues. Jim. Um, whose responsibility is it to make sure something gets recorded in the registry of deeds? Is it is it the code enforcement officer? Is it a landowner? The Cape Elizabeth Planning Board grants many approvals that require recording of plans. Um, those recording requirements always rest with the applicant. Okay. Are there any... Um, I don't want to say recent, but instances of which you're aware here in town where something did not record it in subsequent actions yes, on other projects? We've had a few times where projects have been approved 
Uh, and there has been a deadline when they needed to be recorded and they have failed to been recorded within the deadline and were declared null and void. Um, a couple of those instances, applicants returned to the planning board, got a reapproval and then recorded the reapproved plan within the specified time period. You also have uh, examples of people who will return to you before plan has expired and ask for an extension so that they have more time to meet the recording requirement. John. And on that point, Maureen, is it, uh, has there ever been a situation where there actually was a private access way that was required to be um, recorded and, and was not? There might be, and I would not have known. Um, we require that they be recorded. I have not verified all of the private access ways that have ever been granted by the planning board. Um, are you aware um, if a if a maintenance can a maintenance agreement that's been recorded ever substitute the requirement for a private access way to be recorded? I guess I'd look to the town attorney, but I can't imagine how. Um, the the ordinance says that you must record the plan within 90 days. The letter that was sent to the applicants of 5 South Street at the time gave the date of June 14, 2004 as the, de as the deadline for getting the plan signed and recorded. John, would you like to add to that? Well, as I'm sure you know, um, the requirement for a road maintenance agreement is, is in the ordinance itself. It's also usually a separate condition and requirement in the approval. And the recording of it is a necessary step to put everyone on notice that this obligation has been undertaken by the property owner to perform the, take the obligation to perform the maintenance. Um, the, the ordinance does talk about, and the approval um, at issue in this case, as with other approvals, talks about the obligation on the part of the applicant to record the documents uh, that constitute the approval, which would include the plan. Okay, don't go away. I have a couple questions. Sure. <clears throat> um, so in our zoning ordinance, is there any requirement to consider the presence of a private access way in granting an application for a private roadway? I'm not aware of any requirement within the uh, private road application process for that specific type of issue to be considered, no. Maureen? I agree with him. And, um, Okay, I'll come back to that. Any other questions for John while he's up there? Okay. Question. Question for Maureen. This is, I'm gonna call it a private access way because that doesn't make it one necessarily. Uh, but um, we have other instances where we have had private access ways upgraded to private roads. Yes. And that's fairly common when somebody wants to build another house in, in an area that is serviced by a private access way. Yes, and um, the private access way, private road provisions that are in the ordinance right now were adopted in 1997. Um, the town rewrote its zoning ordinance in 1997 and I was heavily involved in that process. And the, the concept was to get away from the practice the board had had prior to 1997 where repeated private access ways would be applied for on the same driveway. And it, it provided a clearer, more black and white process where it said you can only have one lot access with a private access way and what it does is it pushes you into the private road requirements. It was never intended or drafted to suggest that a private access way was an opportunity to close off any other rights that a private property owner might have to create access to property they owned. Uh, 
I have another quick question and I'll get you. Um, I may have missed it, but was there an actual finding or statement of fact in the planning board's approval that an access way did or did not exist? I'm going to go back to the official decision before I answer that. Okay. And John, if you want to. So I have in front of me a letter dated May 17, signed by uh, the Planning Board Chair, Carol Ann Jordan, for the approval granted on eight Astor Lane Private Road Review. Uh, there are eight findings. Uh, the finding talks about the requirement for a private road review, that it was deemed complete on April 30th, that the planning board waived various private road, previous road requirements. Um, they talk about the chain across South Street. Um, the planning board found that section 19716, creation of a shortcut, was not applicable to the project. Um, the board made a finding about the 2007 comprehensive plan regarding connectivity of roadways. The board made a finding that the town engineer was recommending for replacement of a section of silt fence. And then the board made a finding that the applicant had substantially addressed the standards of the private road review, section 1979, and the subdivision ordinance, section 1631. So there was no finding regarding the private access way related to 5 South Street. I think this is another one from, from Maureen, but um, uh, regarding maintenance agreements, can the theoretical access way slash private road, if you have them be, well, even, even one section of private road, can you have multiple maintenance agreements pertaining to different sections of, of it or Yes, and, and I'm going to switch a little bit more into planner hat than legal requirements of the ordinance. I mean, I think that the town has tried with the private access way requirements and the private road requirements to strike a balance between a compelling town need to have public safety access to all the properties in the town while still allowing members of the public to develop their property. So... Um, when you re allow someone to develop their property and you don't require them to build a two standard town road, you require some private evidence that the private access they're creating, either a private road or a private access way, will be maintained to a level that's gonna be adequate for emergency vehicles. And the, the standard instrument that you use is the road maintenance agreement. We actually have a model road maintenance agreement that we hand out to applicants. They can draft their own road maintenance agreement, which we'll review, but the vast majority of them just use the one we hand out to them at no charge. Uh, the planning board has no authority to compel people to sign the road maintenance agreement except for the applicant in front of you. So as a private access way transitions into a public road or as a public road gets extended over time, um, it's very likely that there can be layers of road maintenance agreement that sit over the same section of private road. Because again, you have no authority to compel people to sign an agreement who aren't in front of you at that time. Nevertheless, there may be people who have private rights that are beyond the authority of the planning board to address to use those areas. So it's, it's, not, un, it's not unusual for there to be multiple private acts, uh, multiple road maintenance agreement to cover the same areas. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other thoughts here? I have a couple thoughts. Um, first of all, I mean, it's been submitted to us clearly that there 
is evidence of maintenance agreement, but none of the access way being submitted. And there's not been a counter argument to that I mean, in, in that nobody's supplied evidence that it's been registered in the deeds from the Munzes. That's in the record. So, you know, no, we're, we're not issuing, the board doesn't issue occupancy permits. That's not our thing. We can't refute an occupancy permit. But, you know, my reading of the zoning ordinance, and it doesn't go past this, is that if it's not, if the plans and the maintenance agreements are not recorded, then it's not valid. So, I mean, I don't know. There's nothing beyond it. It's not, there's no, there's a C, but that's amendments. There's nothing beyond that. So, uh, to me, it's pretty, it's pretty clear. Um, but, and as, as it's been stated, there is a cure for that, and, and that's the fact that if the private road of Maggie and Noel, 8 Astor Lane, is approved, then, it, then there is legal frontage. So if this is held up and it's not approved, then there's no legal frontage, in my opinion. Um, that's, that's my interpretation of the evidence and the ordinance. Um, and, you know, I think others have talked about the gate. I'm not even going to talk about that. Um, but on that issue, I, I think it's clear. But, um, and I, was, I will also say that I've, I watched the video again, and I think actually we discussed a lot of these issues, and I think actually we did a, um, a good job of, of addressing a lot of these issues, and we, and we gave it a lot of thought. And um, I've thought long and hard since this has been put back before us um, about whether I would have changed my mind on any of these issues, and uh, frankly, no. I think we made the right decision. So I just want to make sure, John, that I'm clear here. So we need really to answer the question on whether we believe the private access way is or is not valid. Because, I mean, it, the question of its relevance seems much easier to address because it's not in the ordinance really to address it. But the question of whether or not it is or is not valid, I feel like it's way above my pay grade, really, that, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not, it's a technical question, and um, I'm not in a position to weigh evidence from different lawyers on the subject. Well, one thing I would say is that, that obviously, um, statements made by lawyers... Hey, John, could, could you raise your microphone up oh, a sure. little? Sorry. Statements made by lawyers are, are themselves not evidence. They're here to advocate for their clients, and they're presenting their arguments. Um, the information they submit in support of those arguments is the evidence to consider. Um, and that's what you should focus on in terms of making findings. Um, and all I can do in terms of trying to give you some, some guidance from a legal standpoint in, in applying that um, evidence you're seeing to the standards you have is um, at least with regard to um, the um, validity of a road maintenance agreement, I mean, I'm sorry, of a um, private access way permit um, approval by the planning board. Um, there are certain requirements within the, within the approval you can look to for guidance as to whether or not they've been met. And obviously um, the evidence that's submitted with respect to those questions would be relevant to how you, how you weigh that and how, how your decision should be rendered. So. Um, it, it's really, obviously, questions can get very technical from a legal standpoint, but for your purposes, um, there's information in both the approval itself to the, to the um, Nedwells and also in the ordinance as to what's required to establish a, a private access way. And that can guide you in terms of how to apply the evidence you've heard as part of this process. Okay. Carol Ann. Um, I'm going to go on the record of saying I believe the private access way is not valid because it was not recorded in the Registry of Deeds. I recognize that it has been treated as, treated as such as a valid uh, access way for a number of years, but it, that is not the only example of something that we've dealt with that... Um, did not get properly handled and then 
two or three owners later had to bear the burden of remedying what the original applicant didn't do. We had one just last year that related to lot lines and, and uh, building envelope. Um, and, and the people brought it to us and it, it got taken care of when it was discovered that the house had been around for years. Um, more than 15, I think, probably 20 or 30 years. And um, so I would say based on the fact it's not registered in the Registry of Deeds, it is not a valid access way. Jim? Well, she took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Um, and to do otherwise, I think, sets a dangerous precedent for future applications. Okay. John, you want to weigh in? I, the, the only thing I would um, just ask, and I don't know if counsel for the Munns family or Mr. Munns want to address this, but is there anything that's been presented to us besides um, the road easement information uh, and the argument that because there was a certificate of occupancy given uh, show that the private access way agreement was recorded in the registry of deeds? Because I haven't seen anything. And so I'm just giving you an opportunity. Um, if there is information that you could give to us as a board, uh, I wanted to give that opportunity to you um, because the evidence that we've seen is uh, an affidavit from a uh, paralegal at uh, the law firm for the applicants who's indicated that uh, there wasn't any. And so I just want to see if there's any information that there was uh, from the previous owners of the house. I have them. Peggy McGehee. I um, uh, have had difficulty finding plans in the registry before, and it doesn't surprise me when sometimes plans cannot are not uh, found uh, because of how they're recorded. Uh, so what is the evidence? The evidence is when the Munces um, bought um, their property, um, they had their title attorney uh, and, the, and their realtor review for legitimacy and going into the, uh, the registry of deeds. And so um, their understanding uh, from the title and attorney and from uh, the realtor is that everything was recorded and copacetic. So that is what they understood uh, to be the case. Uh, in, have there been any efforts by you or anybody who works for you to find that within the Registry of Deeds? No, and the reason is because um, it's not the jurisdiction of the board. Frankly, I'm sorry. It's not your jurisdiction to, to, to overturn the code enforcement officer saying to these applicants, this is a private access way, as he said to the town manager and as he said to the planner. This is a private access way. In 2018, he said that. Okay. And therefore, that's why you have to go to the planning board. Well, and the the planning board cannot, and it's just kind of stunning, they cannot say, we're going to look behind your determination because we do not have anything from the code enforcement officer saying it's not recorded. Council, would you, All you have is from the applicant. And Council, would you agree with me, though, when the judge remanded this back to us from the Superior Court that she actually put that onus on this board to find that? And what the uh, court It's a yes did, or no question. Yes, what the court did was remanded it for uh, the, this board to address the question. We had, we had asserted it was valid private uh, access way and that our maintenance screen was, uh, was uh, being affected by it. And the, board, and the court remanded it for this board to take evidence as to whether it's a valid access way. And what we're saying, if there had been nothing from the code enforcement officer, you could have had anybody arguing back and forth. It would be legitimate. But once you have the code enforcement officer saying, by virtue of the certificate of occupancy and notice to the other board members, this is a valid private access way, that's the evidence you must accept. Okay. Can I, well, give can it, well, I, just, I just want to finish my thought on that. Given that we don't have any evidence um, that's been presented besides from the applicants, I would echo what um, Jim and Carol Ann said about not finding that the private access way is valid. Okay, let me hold on. Dan, do you want to I do. I do. weigh in on this? <laughs> sure. Uh, basically, my take on this is, is since the Ned Wells failed to record a copy of the plan showing the private access way within 90 days, it's pretty clear to me, then the access way as permitted is not valid. 
Uh, I just want to read, actually, from the state of Maine, Christopher Munns versus Town of Cape Elizabeth, page 9. Sorry. Uh, the remedy is remand to the board to determine whether, whether the private access way is valid, and if so, whether the private access way and maintenance agreement should be considered in the application. So they're asking us to consider if it's valid, period. So, and we've given as evidence the fact that it was not recorded at the Registry of Deeds as far as we can tell. Does everybody agree with that? Carol Ann. So, next thought regarding it going beyond the validity. And, and this yes. is nothing, not, nothing against the Munns. They, they bought the house with full faith that this, everything was, as she said, copacetic. Um, and the remedy for an in, something that is discovered to be invalid down the road is for the current owner to to um, resubmit and do the, and record the plan and get an approved plan and record it, or in this case, somebody else came in, improved the road, solved the problem of the access way being valid in, or invalid, and. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Uh, to me, the the remedy has been taken care of by the building of well, the private road. Let's move on to the second point: whether the private access way's validity is relevant. I mean, to me, there's nothing in the zoning ordinance that asks us to consider whether there's a private access way in the same place that the private road is. So, it just seems on the surface it's irrelevant. I can't think of why it would be. So any, I don't know if anybody... You're talking about the maintenance agreement? No. No, the private access. There was one of the questions was, is the private access way relevant to whether or not the private road was granted? I, I would agree with you um, that it, it doesn't seem relevant because if, if you've got two lots that are, need to be serviced by that point, that means of access, then it has to be upgraded to a private road in order to service the two lots. So the fact it was a private access way before is, is neither here nor there. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that? Do we have general I, agreement? I, I, I agree with you know, Carol Ann. I think if we don't find that the private access way was valid, then we don't have to address the relevancy. Because uh, as Caroline just pointed out, it's a private road. But what if it was valid? Would we have to address the relevancy? It still seems to me that it would be irrelevant, valid or not. I, I agree with that, yeah. that it wouldn't be relevant. Because yeah. you'd be upgrading the private access. Yeah. The way I look at it is that it's a better going from a private access way to a private road. So that was actually a question I wanted to ask John. Is there any reason that a private access way existing on a road would preclude granting a private road to there's the same the, location. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't interrupt you. Uh, there's nothing I found in the ordinance that suggests that something, for example, that had originally been a private access way couldn't then be upgraded to the level of a private road with appropriate approval from the planning board. And there's nothing in the ordinance I've seen, uh, either in the subdivision ordinance or in the zoning ordinance that would preclude that from happening. And one more question. This <clears throat> maybe is a little far afield, but can you just briefly speak on the difference between an easement and a right of way or a right of access or right of uh, or road right of way being granted? Private, excuse me, a private road. Well, a, a private access way is a, is a creature of ordinance. It's, it's in the town of Cape Elizabeth, it's, as I think uh, Maureen described, a way that the town has uh, devised to try and uh, balance uh, development and safety issues with regard to emergency vehicle access. So that's really something that's a, a provision of zoning law. Um, Easements are a common aspect of real estate law, and they, they basically are, are interests in land, uh, usually less than a, a full fee interest. It's usually the right to use land in a certain way. And that is, can be created in any number of ways, but it's a, it's a private right that you have 
when you, um, when you say, for example, acquire a piece of property. There's always a dominant estate and a serving estate, the person against or over which the easement runs is the serving estate to the, the person who has the right to use it. Okay, so are we kind of agreed on our reason for the relevancy of the private access way in our decision? Um, so let's just move on a sec. Are there any other issues regarding the application that anybody wants to bring up or discuss in any way? For, for me, I, I'm going to rest on what uh, the findings were at the time, all the evidence that we looked at, uh, the site walk that we did, um, and then I think the information that we received with uh, regards to this issue uh, really hasn't changed uh, my opinion from what the previous findings of fact uh, were, and they have provided me some guidance uh, with regards to the issue that the court remanded back to us to decide. Does everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have a motion? We have a motion. I move that the board table this agenda item and that the town attorney prepare findings of fact and conclusions of law based on the board's discussion tonight for the board to review and vote on at the next regular board meeting. Yes, sir. John, do you have enough? Uh, I, I believe there should be enough for me to put the, the draft and then obviously it will get to the board to decide whether or not to vote to approve the draft items together. Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Jim's going to go drink some water.
<laughs> okay, next item on the agenda. The town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a resource protection permit and subdivision amendments to the Hemlock Hill and Oakhurst Glen subdivisions as part of a drainage improvement project to be constructed at the end of Hemlock Hill Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1983 resource protection regulations and section 1625 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. So who's gonna present? Good evening, my name is Robert Malley. I'm the Director of Public Works and I'm representing the applicant, the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the town listed the services of Sebago Technics and our town engineer, Steve Harding, is here tonight to uh, present our proposal to you. And if you have any questions, Steve and I are here to answer those. So I'd like to welcome Steve and the podium. You can proceed. Thank you, Bob. Um, uh, Bob and I have actually been at this for quite some time. Um, I think we started in 2010, uh, actually looking at drainage issues in the neighborhood uh, in Oakhurst and in, in Hemlock Hill. Uh, these efforts started again in uh, 2015, and uh, we've had some fits and spurts, but we've really gained momentum this year and uh, hope to have this built here in the next month or so. So I'm gonna try to use this laser pointer. Basically, this is an exhibit out of your application. So um, over here is Mitchell Road, just off the edge of the map. This is Oakhurst going along here. And then we have Hemlock Hill here. And this is the area where we're proposing to do the drainage improvements. Uh, just to get you oriented, this is the um, Oakhurst, uh, Oakhurst Glen subdivision over in this area. And the town has actually uh, been in conversations with the Bennetts who own this parcel uh, to this uh, dash line now currently, and this larger parcel, which is about 1.6 acres. And basically in splitting that, the Bennetts would retain a strip of that, which is basically the slope, and then the, the low-lying area here, which contains an RP1 wetland, uh, the town would purchase. So those conversations are ongoing. Hopefully we'll finish those uh, soon. Um, and then that's, that's the amended subdivision part of the um, Oakhurst Glen subdivision. The Hemlock Hill subdivision is this uh, dashed line around here. This was uh, done back in uh, around 2000 and it uh, included Abaco Drive, which extends off to this direction, and then there were the two houses, the house that's now occupied by the Clancy's and the branches that were done at that time. Uh, during that um, subdivision approval, this area was mapped as an RP1 wetland. There was a 100-foot uh, uh, buffer provided around it, and then the uh, development went through in that area. And in this, where this, these work, uh, area is going to be the end of the public way of Hemlock Hill ends up right about here. So we'll need an easement from the Clancy's, an easement from the branches to construct the improvements, and then the branches easement would also include the flowage rights to go across their property to this uh, new land that the, uh, the town is hoping to purchase. Um, so uh, I'm going to switch, hopefully, switch drawings. tell who's not the Apple conversant uh, user in the room. Uh, this is the area of uh, uh, the drainage improvements. Uh, essentially, Hemlock Hill, uh, this is the end of Hemlock Hill. This is be the end of the uh, publicly accepted part of Hemlock Hill. And what happens, the water all comes from uh, the uh, Mitchell Road intersection, heads down the hill, and then we're also getting some water from the Oakhurst Glen uh, neighborhood that actually comes through a pipe here. Currently, um, there's a pipe that ex uh, outfalls here, goes through a paved swale into a culvert and comes down here and drops um, off in this area. And essentially, it's a point discharge. If you remember from our sidewalk, the uh, outlet's elevated a couple of feet above uh, the surrounding grades. There's a few rocks on the where the water ends up, but it's a, essentially a, a point discharge. And then the other thing that happens is water comes down here. There's a little berm on, the, this is the Whitney's property. 
and uh, it hits the berm and comes down here and ends up in the Clancy's driveway and eventually makes its way over here. Uh, so the, the Clancy's, the Branches, the Whitney's, uh, and uh, the Schoen bombs have all been talked, uh, have, we've all had conversations with them, uh, so they're aware of this and uh, are supportive of the project. Essentially what we're going to do is add these catch basins in the roadway. Uh, we've got one here that will be a drainage manhole, it'll be a structure onto the end of that pipe and these all get collected, moved down here in a discharge pipe and then instead of having that point discharge we're going to have a riprap swale going to a level spreader which actually is like a trough and it fills up and then the water spills out over the trough, over the, this um, uh, level area, goes, goes down the riprap and into an apron area and spreads off into the wooded buffer, <coughs> buffer area uh, as sheet flow. Uh, we did in, in, include some drainage calculations along with this. Essentially what it tells you, we're not changing any of the surface characteristics, so the same volume of water is going to end up into the RP1 wetland. Uh, it's just going to get there more efficiently, so it will get there a little faster. And the way we're, we're uh, compensating for that is, to, again, creating this uh, level lip spreader to slow down the velocity so that uh, we don't create any erosion. And we also get the benefit of the wooded buffer that the water is going to sheet flow through to further treat the water. Um, these drainage improvements, have, uh, drainage calculations have been reviewed by the town's peer reviewer. Uh, doesn't have any comments on that. Uh, the two, two comments that Todd Gammon did have, he added, he suggested adding a spot grade right here so the contractor would realize that this is uh, part of the berm and the, the lower level area is right through here. So that's that's a good comment and no, no problem for us at all. The other comment that Todd made was this, we had this as a five foot diameter uh, uh, basin structure. He suggested looking at whether a four foot diameter would work. From an engineering standpoint, either one would work. It's just the four foot would be a little bit uh, more efficient and cost effective. Uh, so we're looking into that. Uh, again, no problem meeting those, uh, uh, those comments. Um, the uh, couple of waivers that we've asked for, um, one is the vegetated uh, buffer, uh, excuse me, the vegetated cover description of the buffer area in the wetlands. We went back into the Hemlock Hill uh, archives and tried to find and see if that, when that RP <coughs> wetland was uh, documented, whether there was any written description with it, and there wasn't. Um, so we're, we're asking for a waiver of that. The other uh, waiver we're asking for is the high intensity soils mapping. Again, all the work we're doing is in this uh, buffer area, no work's being done in the wetlands. It's all areas that are either in the roadway itself or on the lawn or just on the fringes of the, of the wooded area along here. Uh, we did provide a, a soils uh, mapping from the USDA and the Natural uh, Resource uh, Conservation Groups, uh, which is typical of what we would use uh, for drainage uh, studies when in uh, situations where we don't have high intensity soil surveys. Um, I think I've hit all the points that uh, I had hoped to make, Bob. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Yes, or any questions you may have? Okay, any questions? For so we're looking at complete. Yes. Right. Any questions any, before we open the, okay, um, are there any, I'm going to open the public comment section. Uh, if anybody has any comments on completeness of the application, uh, come on over to the lectern. And we're going to limit you to three minutes. I think it could be a lot quicker than that. My name is Herbert Rao. I live on 2 Hemlock Hill Road. I applaud what you've done. I think it's a great idea. I notice, though, that where Mitchell Road comes on into Hemlock Hill Road, this being at the corner of Hemlock Hill 1, that there's a tremendous amount of water flow flowing off of Mitchell Road. We're actually seeing erosion taking place on the shoulder of that road. And I and my colleague, uh, we wind up shoveling well, about two or three cubic square feet, cubic feet of sand every year because of what happens from the erosion taking place. My question is whether the thought of a catch basement up on the corner by the telephone pole where Hemlock Hill meets Mitchell 
had been considered to help move some more of that water down. I noticed that the way the water is running during severe rainstorms, that there is a severe amount of water which is running down on the side of Hemlock Hill number one, three, and five. It bifurcates across the road, so it's running down two, four, and six. Significant amount of water that every winter I'm shoveling it out so that my driveway doesn't freeze up. So it's just a question if consideration has been given to a catch basement at the head of Hemlock Hill Road or at Meach Mitchell Road <coughs> on the, I think it would wind up being the south side. Thank okay. You. Does anybody have any questions or comments on completeness of the application? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the session. Steve, can you remember that question? Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any comments or questions on completeness? Somebody like to make a motion? Um, motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for a resource protection permit and amendments to the Hemlock Hill and Oakhurst Glen subdivisions to construct drainage improvements at the end of the Hemlock Hill Road be deemed complete. Sir. All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, the application is complete, so we can begin discussion of it. Um, I just want to point out to the public that the board did hold a site visit on September 3rd uh, with Bob and Steve, and we um, got a good look at the entire project. So does anybody have any items they wish to discuss? Or questions? Just uh, one question, I don't know if this would be for the applicant or for Maureen, but uh, there was an indication that the uh, landowners, uh, the property owners uh, on the Hemlock Hill Road um, uh, approved of this project and I just wanted to verify uh, that you haven't received any information contrary. Matt, I, I had asked the, um, the applicant, which is the town, to provide evidence that they had permission, right title or interest, and we've received um, written emails from, peop from those property owners saying they were supporting the project. Uh, we do know that the applicant, the town, will need to finalize ownership at some point, but for the purposes of this review, it seems like we have permission to move ahead. Thank you. Jim. Carol Ann. I have a question. Are the easements in the submission, are those the final easements or have they been signed or are those being negotiated still? No, the, the, the easements that are in the book are, are work progress of where we're at. What we're hoping to do is uh, get approval tonight, hopefully get you folks to sign some mylars that we have, take those down to the registry, get those recorded. Then we can go back into those easements but the, you'll see there was an Exhibit A and an Exhibit B. The Exhibit A will stay because that's the description, the surveyor's description of the property. We would then take out the Exhibit B and instead we would reference the recorded plan and clean that up and then give that to uh, the branches and the Clancy's for them to sign that. And the, uh, the Bennett's where the land acquisition is, we're going back and forth with them and that's, that's a, you know, hopefully nearing its conclusion. Okay, thank you. Steve, do you want to address the question the gentleman had asked? Yeah, I'll beginning? take a shot at it and I'll defer to Bob. Uh, basically, we looked at this. We're trying to fix the problem down at the, the base of the, the hill, um, which has been a historical uh, issue for these landowners. There is quite a bit of water coming from Mitchell Road down Hemlock Hill. Uh, the concern with putting a catch basin up there, we would probably have to run it all the way down Hemlock Hill and tie into this system. Um, which were, from, from my standpoint would be a cost uh, concern because of the ledge that's present on Hemlock Hill. If you go down, look at the side, there's, there's quite a bit of ledge. Uh, we're hoping that we can avoid it with this, but that would be my first uh, issue. We could obviously go meet with the gentleman and take a look at it and see if there's other solutions. Well, I would agree with Steve's comments. Hemlock Hill was built uh, in an era when you know, really a lot of uh, modern drain storm drainage infrastructure was not put in normally you'd have catch basins at intersections you'd have catch basins every 250 300 feet so uh, this isn't an uncommon approach to addressing this 
uh, you know, maybe there's something from a maintenance standpoint we can do at the intersection to uh, alleviate the runoff. But uh, we did uh, locate a catch basin on the northerly side uh, near the turnaround, and, and that's hoped to catch some of that water coming down the northerly side of the street. But it's a, it's a very short street, and uh, again, as Steve said, from a cost-effective standpoint, and uh, we really had some issues more so on the, on the end of the street where water was sheeting onto private property without any proper easements or proper infrastructure in place. Okay, are there any other questions? Well, just following on that then, um, if there was, if this was put in place, uh, and then it's still found that there's significant issues at the, the Mitchell intersection with water sheeting down. Is the system size large enough to, if you needed to put additional catch basin up, basically upstream, to take that, you know, take that in? We, we have looked at some additional infrastructure uh, from stormwater coming from Oakhurst. It's not part of this plan. Uh, but I believe our infrastructure is sized to accommodate that. Yeah, yeah, basically, we, we submitted the drainage study, um, or the drainage calculations, and we did take that into account. So uh, the, the water that is coming from uh, Hemlock up by Mitchell Road, if we were to put catch basins, uh, do we size these uh, pipes appropriately so that they can handle that flow? It's just a matter of the cost of, of yeah. going up and, and making that connection and whether or not it's feasible to spend that. Yeah, it just seemed like um, at least you could do it if you had to without ripping everything back up again. I mean, it just seems like a yeah. kind of an easier first step anyway, or yeah, better first step. It's yeah. a, I think it's about 300 feet to the intersection, something like that. I, I'm, so. not suggesting you, I'm not suggesting you do it. I'm just saying no. It, no. for planning purposes, it would be better to do what yeah, you did. We, so. we would still get the same amount of water. It would just get there a little bit more efficiently and not, not get down the street. Any other questions? Would someone like to make a motion? Okay, I'll, yeah. do I'll, do, I'll do this one, John. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> Findings of fact, the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a resource protection permit and subdivision amendments to the Hemlock Hill and Oakhurst Glen subdivisions as part of a drainage improvement project to be constructed at the end of Hemlock Hill Road which require review by, for compliance with section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations and section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Two, the planning board conducted a site visit at 6 p.m. on September 3rd, 2019, at which time the applicant's engineer described the proposed improvements. The drainage improvements will not materially obstruct the flow of surface or subsurface water across or from the alteration area. The drainage improvements will not impound sur surface water or reduce the absorptive capacity of the al alteration area so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties. The drainage improvements will not increase the flow of surface water across or the discharge of surface waters from the alteration area so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. Six. The drainage improvements will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitat for aquatic life, birds, or other wildlife. The drainage improvements will not pose problems related to the support of structures. The drainage improvements will not be detrimental to aquifer recharge or the quality or qu quantity or quality of groundwater. Nine, the drainage improvements will not disturb coastal dunes or contiguous back dune areas. Ten, drainage improvements will maintain or improve ecological and aesthetic values. Eleven, the drainage improvements will alter 1,700 square feet of wetland buffer and otherwise will maintain an adequate buffer area between the wetland and adjacent land uses. 12, the drainage improvements will be accomplished in conformance with the erosion prevention 
provisions of environmental quality handbook erosion and sediment control published by Maine Soil and Water Conservation Commission dated March 1986 or subsequent revisions thereof. 13, the drainage improvements will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings or from other construction into wastewater treatment facilities in violation of section 15-1-4 of the sewage ordinance. And 14, the drainage improvements will are not located in a floodplain. 15, the drainage improve, the, the drain, excuse me, the subdivision amendments will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control plan provided. 16, the subdivision amendments will have, an, will not have an undue adverse impact on scenic or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to shoreline. 17, the applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. 18, the subdivision amendments will not adversely impact surface water quality. 19, the subdivision amendments are in compliance with the town wetland regulations and in, and in the zoning ordinance. 20, the subdivision amendments will provide for adequate stormwater management. 21, the Oakhurst Glen subdivision and Hemlock Hill subdivision have been previously approved by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to be in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the findings and decisions of those approvals which are, are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. 22, the application subsequent substantially complies with section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations and section 16-2-5 amendments <coughs> to previously approved subdivisions. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for resource protection permit and amendments to the Hemlock Hill and Oakhurst Glen subdivisions to construct drainage improvements at the end of Hemlock Hill Road be approved subject to the following conditions. That the plans be revised to satisfy the comments of the acting town engineer, Todd Gammon's letter dated 9-11-2019. To the, the remaining 11,582 square feet of lot U33 54B, not to be purchased by the town of Cape Elizabeth, be merged with lot U33 55A to create a single lot. And three, that no alteration of the site, there will be no alteration of the site until the subdivision plans have been signed by the planning board and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Do you have a second, Jim? No, well, no. It, it, Did I? Is number two correct? It, you, you hesitated. Oh, it's just awkward reading. I tried to rewrite it, but, but I. But it should say of lot U3354 would be to be purchased, or is it not? It's correct That's, as written? It's correct as written. Okay. <laughs> it's the section that we're not buying. Okay. I second that. <laughs> Okay, can I offer a friendly man? You may, because I may have... Number 13. Oh, wow. Strike the word and at the end of that. Oh, did I read the word and? You did. Oh. Well, you read it as it was. <laughs> okay. Andrew. Uh, I had a question before we sign off on this. Were we supposed to have a hearing after for... Um, I mean, we had one for completeness, but are we... We should have a public hearing. Sorry. <laughs> it takes three people to keep you in line, Joe. <laughs> All right. Well, is there anyone here? Would you, let me open the meeting to a public hearing on the application. Is there anyone here to speak on it? Seeing none, I close the meeting. <laughs> I mean, the uh, public hearing. That was close. <laughs> yeah. We could have amended things. There was still time. Okay, thank you. Uh, are we going to vote now? Um, I have a question for Maureen. Uh, so if you don't have that uh, condition of that the lot has to be merged with the parent lot, could they split that off? No, not legally. That, I mean, that, 
no, to be was, to be clear, the this uh, the planner and and other people have had um, um, enthusiastic discussions about this issue, and this land is in the RC district. The minimum lot size in the RC district is twenty thousand square feet. So the only way to create a legal lot in the RC district is to have a 20,000 square foot lot with 100 feet of frontage or in a road, or to go through a subdivision process where you can you can take advantage of open space zoning provisions. Um, Dude, what's the size of the lot? The the created? the lot right now is my, the the lot that the town is purchasing. It before they divide it up is large lot, but it is pretty much unbuildable because of the large RP1 wetland. So the abutting property owner has said, I'd like to keep a part of it because it's the slope and I'd like to make my, my home lot a little bigger. And the concern I have is that the plan that you sign make it brutally clear that that piece that they're retaining has to be merged with their home lot. Right. It can't be I'm a asking, fragment. You know, is the second is the lot that we're creating forty thousand square feet or more, or is it less? It's it's your mer the lot that the town is buying exceeds twenty thousand square feet. No, the lot that the owner's retaining. The, after no, this little piece the, the 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 so the owner the the own. No, yeah. I I finally understand your question. <laughs> I, I tried to rewrite that and not have the negative in there, but I couldn't do it, so I just left it the way it was. So you, so let me just clarify myself for your question. So your question is, if the eleven thousand five hundred eighty-two square feet is added to the the U three three five five A, it's not greater than 39,999 square feet. Correct. Okay. All right. Shall we vote? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Next item on the agenda. <clears throat> David Smith is requesting a private road review of a portion <clears throat> excuse me, of Cunner Lane to amend slash replace a 1997 public access waiver granted by the planning board where a turnaround was proposed on the east side of a lot located at 19 Cunner Lane. The applicant would like to relocate the turnaround and has submitted an application aligned with current regulations. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 1979, private road review. Um, okay, Bob. Good evening. With that, Maureen, I'm the second Apple challenge person. Good evening. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Bob Metcalf of Mitchell Associates, uh, representing uh, David Smith. With me this evening is uh, Donna Hawks from Wright Ryan, uh, who is representing uh, the owner's interest. Uh, Cunnell Lane is, starts at the end of Hannaford Cove Road, and this is just an aerial that comes in. Hannaford Cove Road is up in this corner, that cut, cut off in the aerial, and it runs down along here. The parcels in question are this area in here, which was lot 26 and lot 261. Uh, 
The prior owner had uh, divided this parcel uh, back in 1996 to create 26-1 one, and at that time obtained a private access way to access the property in this general location here. Uh, in 1997, the town changed the private access way ordinance, which uh, required uh, the applicant when he was going to build this house to address the current requirements for private access way. Uh, and one of those was to install uh, fire suppression to accommodate for the additional structure here. Uh, the applicant went through the process um, of looking at installing a new water main in here. Unfortunately, Cunner Lane does not follow the center line of the right of way. And because of some of the coastal intrusions along this outer edge in here, uh, would require private easements, uh, easements on private property in order to stall the water main, and he was unsuccessful in obtaining those easements. Uh, as a result, uh, Mr. Smith met with uh, Chief Gleason to discuss some other options of how to address this, uh, and the result was looking at putting in a 10,000-gallon underground fire cistern, which I'll go through. Uh, hey, Maureen. Oh, I just got to scan further down, sorry. So the existing conditions that are out there right now is, as I said, this is Cunner Lane. And the driveway that served this residence is in this location here. And the new driveway that has been installed when this house was constructed actually follows the same relative alignment as the driveway that served the back original house. The actual limits of the property for the parcel actually comes out into this portion of Cunner Lane. This actually is considered part of Cunner in terms of circulation out there. So in terms of being able to meet those fire suppression requirements, this is the general area we're looking at putting in a fire cistern. So what was constructed out there is the road, which is a concrete paver road drive right now that comes here as well as this is where the T turnaround um, was constructed to meet the town's churning movement requirements. Both the, the fire turnaround has already been reviewed by Chief Gleason after it was installed. The roadway itself was installed by LP Murray and Sons and actually in your application document is a certification that the road construction means were met the town standards. The only thing we'll be addressing, which is a waiver request is in terms of the overall width of that roadway, and I'll get into that as we move forward. So, But that's an overview of what the existing conditions are out there right now. This is a, an aerial view of the property. This is the new house that was just recently constructed. And this is the access drive, the concrete paver access drive that comes in. Currently, at this end of the property, there is a um, code access control gate uh, for access to these two, two lots. In discussions with Maureen as we were looking at this, it turned out it wasn't an amendment to a private access way, but because of its location, it had to become a private road application. In order to do the private road and meet the town's requirements, the existing road is located here. The outer edge of the right-of-way had to occur along the property line, which serves 26-1. So the resulting right-of-way, in order to accommodate picking up the roadway in this existing turnaround uh, pull-out area at the entranceway, uh, the right-of-way is 73 feet 6 inches or 7 inches wide, and it's a parallel. And the turnaround itself falls within the right-of-way with the exception of this one small portion for the required dimensions for the turnaround, and it has an easement for the remaining portion of the T turnaround. Otherwise, everything is within the right-of-way the, the right for the new private road. The fire systems we were talking about will be two 5,000-gallon sister tanks together. Uh, that will be located in this area. It'll have a dry hydrant. The dry hydrant connection location is something we're still working with the fire chief as to where he really would like it to be. Uh, right now, it's located on this this particular structure. Uh, we're constructing a proposed a proposing a pullout area, which will be a gravel base meeting the requirements depth typically for the road profile. 
uh, for the fire department to be able to pull off into this location here. Uh, we reviewed that with uh, Chief Gleason out on site several months ago uh, and reviewed the situation and he was fine with that uh, dimensions for, those, uh, for that pull out area. Uh, this is a relatively uh, steep gradient going down into a hollow in here. There's a ledge out in this area. So we're looking at to minimize the amount of ledge removal that part of the cistern will be built up and then the grading will occur around that to cover over the cistern itself. And I know I'll get to Mr. Harding's comments, but one of his comments was making sure that we meet the 2% cross slope in there and we will address that. As I said, there's a gate in this location. It's an access code gate. Uh, we had discussions with the chief and we still haven't worked through the final details. It's a code access gate as to whether or not a new code uh, for the fire and police department to have access or whether a knox box gets put on the gate post uh, for access to that. And that's still a coordination with the chief as to what his preference is. The applicants find any of the direction that uh, the chief desires. In terms of the actual width, the concrete pavers are 10 feet wide and there's a two foot gravel shoulder. In some cases, it's actually a little bit wider. The, the survey went up and picked up the outer edges of that gravel way. So it's a minimum of 14 foot wide, uh, 10 feet of the pavers and two foot grass gravel shoulders on either side. And the full extent of the right away again comes down to this location in here. Here. Um, the waivers that we were requested uh, were in tab section, tab 10 in the booklet. This was the standard boundary survey. The survey for the limits of the right of way have been completely done by Owen Haskell uh, and have certified and will provide a legal description on that uh, right of way area. So that is the limit of the boundary survey that we've had recently done. Uh, there was a survey that they've done parts of, uh, but it isn't an actual overall composite boundary survey for the entire property. Uh, this portion here, which was the original single parcel, was done by a prior uh, surveyor. <coughs> no one has to utilize their information to create the overall composite plan for the property. So. Traffic study, the applicants requested a waiver of providing a traffic study. Basically, there's no, the only increase is the one additional house that's located on here, which was an approved lot back in 96. So there's really no additional generation of a lot of traffic coming off of this site. Uh, storm water management plan, the road was already constructed. It's a relatively flat area. As I said, it grades off in this direction and then it also slopes back in this direction. The way the driveway was crowned, it sheets water in both directions. It's an insignificant amount of runoff that has no negative impacts on either side uh, of where the current road is located. Uh, in terms of the private road design standards, we're requesting a waiver for the roadway being located in the center of the right-of-way. And the reasons for that, as I explained, in order to meet the width requirements and incorporate the roadway in there, that uh, falls to the outer edge of the right-of-way. Uh, so we're requesting a waiver for the location of it within the center of the right-of-way. Uh, and then again, the road width, requesting a waiver of that for the, uh, the width being 10 foot of the concrete pavers and the two foot gravel shoulders. Uh, back on the stormwater, Mr. Harding, one of his comments was we did not need this on there that requires an enclosed drainage system. There is no need for an enclosed drainage system on here and I know under his review that he had no, took no issues with that, but we were not proposing an enclosed drainage system for this section. So that's uh, pretty much an overview of what the request is. Is that it? John, quick question. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll just wait for public hearing completeness before okay. I ask my question. All right, the meeting is now open to public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak on the issue of completeness for this application? Okay, seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. John? Uh, Bob, I'm not sure if you could um, answer this. Uh, 
I, I understand the, the waiver requests, and I, I don't really have too much of an issue, but we did receive um, an email or a letter dated September 13th from an attorney at Murray, Plum and Murray, that was indicating that there's ongoing litigation, apparently, between the applicant and uh, numerous neighbors on the street. And the concern that was being brought up um, in the letter, I think, from what I can see from it, was the portion of the application with regards to the private road that's, yes, on the outside of that gate. It yeah. seemed that the neighbors had no problem with everything that's happening on the inside of that gate. Yeah. Um, and from my review, I, I don't really have too many issues with regards to completeness on that. Um, but I just wanted to see if you wanted to address that or if that's something that um, the applicant, or why does that have to be part of uh, the request? This portion? Yeah. yeah. It's really not. It's really this is the portion, but because their property line runs out into this part of Cunner Lane, okay. that is the defined easement area. To, uh, right-of-way area that we have to provide. Otherwise, we'd be chopping off the lot, and this would be basically an independent parcel, which would be non-conforming to your zoning. Now, let's say oh, would, would there be a requirement for that well, part it, to be chopped off? I, I'm not saying... Well, it's not chopped up. This actually is their property line. You're right. Okay. Okay. So what the private, act, private road portion, really, it's for this construction. We're not doing anything to this. But because that's where the lot line falls here, we're just creating that additional line there to actually create the right of way for the private road. There's no proposed changes out here whatsoever. Everything stays the way it is paid right now. Okay. I see Maureen kind of squirming in her seat, so I was wondering if yeah. she had something <laughs> to say about that. Well, I'd like to call attention to the fact that the town's attorney has remained at the meeting. Oh, hi. And has, is here to monitor this and provide advice to the board for your next meeting. Um, because there are some concerns. Uh, this dates back to 1997. Uh, the original approval was not a private access way, it was a public access waiver, which is something that existed in the old zoning ordinance. So we're trying to bridge the gap between the old zoning ordinance and 2019. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned how we do that because the actual connection to a public road is over on Hannaford Cove Road. So what we're trying to do is amend an approval from 1997 using the 2019 zoning ordinance because you can't grant approvals today that don't comply with your current ordinance. Um, and the turnaround, if you could point to the turnaround, Bob. The, the old turnaround, excuse oh, the me. Turnaround. The old turnaround. Right in here. So you've reviewed Connor Lane from Hannaford Grove to that point. And what we need to do is if we're, if we're using the old approval and assume that the review that you performed in 1997 determined that from Hannaford Cove to that point, Hanner, Han, Connor Lane was adequate. Let's just call it adequate. Adequate for what? It's adequate for access, for emergency access. That in 1997, the fire chief at the time made recommendations, the town engineer reviewed it, the planning board approved it, and all of those things are the way they are now. So the only thing the applicant is trying to do is get rid of that turnaround that sits in front of the house and move it over to the side as part of changing the access. So I'm trying to figure out a way to incorporate the planning board's review from the southern edge of the old, from the current proposed turnaround, the current approved turnaround to the the actual access is being proposed. So that's why we grabbed the private road frontage along the entire section of this lot. We still have a little gap. And I'm hoping that by the next meeting, we might have a solution for the planning board to be able to um, act on this applicant's request uh, without triggering uh, challenges from the abutters. Uh, my thought was perhaps 
and again, we probably want to delay this until next month to figure something out here, but perhaps a finding that any private road approval that the planning board grants is intended to comply with zoning ordinance road frontage requirements and does not convey any ownership rights that do not exist prior to the prior private road approval. It would be nice if the planning board could stay out of the dispute between the current applicant and the abutters over the ownership of Cunner Lane. And I echo that statement. Um, one question on that, Maureen. Yeah. You indicated that, so there was an old turnaround that was part of the approved, or an old approved turnaround that right. Bob is pointing towards. That's never been built. It was never built. It would have to, and, and it could be built tomorrow. The applicant could come in tomorrow and finish up the original approval. You would have to break through a stone wall. My understanding is that nobody wants that. Right, and, but there's never been an issue with regards to the fire chief saying that, oh, you know, there's no turnaround down here. No, the, the, actually the 1997 approval that was granted by the planning board was challenged in court and was upheld. So that's why I say that 1997 approval, as far as I know, is valid. Um, okay. So what we're trying to figure out now is how to amend that approval under our current ordinance to a location that I think generally makes sense for everyone, but to try to tiptoe around the ongoing legal issues between the applicant and the abutters. Yeah, because I would like to do that too. As far as our, what we have to look at as a board, um, I just want to make sure for the comp purposes of completeness um, that we're not jumping into that legal quagmire that seems to exist uh, between all these parties. Um, but I, for, with regards to the waivers that are requested and um, the fire chief approving the underground um, water system, I, I don't really have too much of an issue with that with regards to completeness. I just... I mean, I make maps all day long, and honestly, I've been staring at this thing, and I cannot figure out what exactly I'm looking at. I mean, Connor Lane, is that a private, that's a private access way that was created in 1997 to access that? Can somebody actually walk me through this map? Because I see lots of, lot, I see lot lines as far as I can oh, tell. you got a bunch of stuff going on. <laughs> you don't have a bigger area map, do you? It's okay. Not with me. Don't. Sorry. If you look at this highlighted keep line up in the upper left hand corner, right? Basically oh, yeah. that line is the property line and the fifty foot right away for Connell Lane goes in the oh, this thing's not fifty feet away at all. Anyway, the right of way is on this side and on this common boundary line with this lot. So actually the construction of Connell Lane and this portion, all of this has been constructed within what was lot 26, now 26 and 26-1, and a good portion of it's across the right-of-way line on this edge as well. So it's not within the center line of what was defined as the Connor Lane right-of-way. And that was part of, I can't remember, what was the subdivision? I mean, I've been dealing with different parcels over here between Hannaford, Hannaford Cove Road and some of the other ones out there. That was part of an overall subdivision, if I remember correctly that Colonel Lane was part of years ago? I, I don't, I've never, I don't know. So. So. And, hold on. So this, when you come down to the end of Cutter Lane and turn yep. right, yep. does that lead to more than one lot or any lots? That goes to the existing lot on this corner. This, I believe, is just a paper street. Correct. It's down here. So there are rights in that paper street that other property owners may have. Okay. I just, I just want to finish completeness, and, and then we can go back to the weeds. And, uh, and, I, and I would also comment that based on these questions, I would say a site visit is probably in order. So, but let's finish completeness. <laughs> would you like a motion? I would love if everybody sat with questions. Okay. 
Yes, give us okay. a motion. Be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of David Smith for a private road review of a portion of Connor Lane located on the south side of 19 Connor Lane be deemed complete. Second. All in favor? Who seconded? Jim. 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 Thank you. Another motion? Or do we want to, we can discuss, oh, we can discuss detail now. Okay. I didn't well, want to table with me. You, you don't want to do that if you're going to schedule a site visit, but okay. you should do that next. I do, I do have, I have two concerns on the waivers, and one of them we've, we've alluded to, and that is the boundary survey. I, I, I get that what you're going to be offering is a compilation of surveys that have occurred over the last how many years? I don't know, five years? Four the base survey is the one that was done for the prior property owner. Owen Haskell used that survey as the basis to extrapolate everything else, and then I had them do the delineation for the right of way. So the meets and bounds are based on the subdivision of the, the survey plan that was done for the prior owner. Okay. Owen Haskell can't certify that because they haven't done the full boundary survey. Right. But they can certify the limits of the right of way based on the plan that was approved in 1996. Okay. But I don't, I'm trying not to get into this litigation seems to, to then go to survey to lot lines. Uh, and, and I don't um, want to go there. If you want me to. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to close the door on that, but my because I've I've asked John. There's been there's been multiple cross suits and some judgments, and I haven't read them. But my sense is that um, the ownership issues are more along the lines of potentially adverse possession rather than debates about where the lot line is okay. for the for the two lots. If that if that is. True. If that is the case, then I have no issue with a waiver on the survey. Um, the other, the road width, um, I would be willing to go with, I have no idea what other property that Mr. Smith owns that is buildable down there. It's I know he owns the, the property on the other side of the the road. I, I believe that the amount of division is just about done. I don't believe anything else, Donnie. Okay. No, nothing else. Nothing. Yeah. There's no potential for them to we, build we, something else. We there. can go back and 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 Cause I confirm would, that. I would go with that road width only if there was a condition that if ever anything else was built in there, that road would need to be brought up to a higher standard. And, and I, we can I, confirm. Yeah, I, I believe that the total amount of ownership is around five acres and this is a two acre zone, so I, th I don't think you can okay. you can get more than the two, but um, we can confirm that those for are, next those month. Those are my two concerns with the waivers. Jim. I'm not sure it's relevant to completeness, but what's this five foot strip of land conveyed to Harry E. Baker Company? Does that? Pose anything as to what we're doing here? Seems odd, but I don't. I just I see it. No, one thing. For what it's worth, I, I think at the workshop, um, if my memory serves me right, that issue about another possible division of that property was addressed, and I think it was represented that there wasn't another lot that could, or it could, that it could not be subdivided again. But I would like to get confirmation as well. I actually, the waiver regarding road width, um, I kind of struggle with because what I'm seeing is a 10 foot concrete uh, driveway with two foot, I mean, you're 14 feet, 22 feet is what's required, right? Because it's private road, there's two lots. That's vastly under what you know, that's eight feet less. And my concern, and that second house that's at the end of it is quite a distance from, you know, actually even where these dry hydrants would be. M my concern is like, could, you know, say one of these trucks gets stuck, how are you gonna get anything around it at 14 feet? Um, and then you're talking about 
grass or whatever. I don't even know what's on. It says lawn, but I don't know what underlays that. I mean, we have. What you're going to have, it's a 14 foot wide gravel cross section, mm -hmm. and then it tapers beyond that. So that what you have is two foot sections on either side of the concrete pavers that acts as travel surface, and then the gravel extends off. So that's stabilized. And then this turnout area, the chief was satisfied with that he could be able to pull in a piece of equipment here and be able to get another piece of equipment out. We met with him extensively to go over all this, especially after it was already constructed, to find out what issues, if any, he had with being able to meet access requirements. And there was nothing raised. We had this in this turnaround here. He was satisfied. With that. So really, it's more like I mean, I think it's just the maybe maybe the language in here is not great, to be honest, to, in the description, because I mean, it, it looks like it's just maximum 15 feet of travel surface, and what you're saying is probably there's more like 18 feet at least, right? It'll vary because on this side slope over here, there was extra fill. This doesn't drop off rapidly, but there was gravel brought in. But in terms of Skip Murray's construction of that, the certification was that full 14 foot width is what he's certifying to. We didn't go into the rest of the fill that's beyond those. Well, Matt, I, so there's been discussions with the police chief, or the fire chief, excuse me, um, and he's okay with it. I, I mean, I would prefer to see some sort of lever, letter backing that up, that he's okay with the travel width and quarter as it stands, given I believe we gave you an email. I think we have that. Yeah. So the oh, most, yeah, sorry. The biggest well, reduction we've approved since I've been on the board, I think, is down to 18 or 16 feet. 12. 12, 12 for the entire? Becky's cold lane. Okay. 10 does seem skinny. Well, his, his, sorry. So this is 15, it's, are you calling it 14 or 15 feet? We're calling it 14, but when the survey picked up in this area here, they picked out the other limits of the gravel being a little further out. But I'm saying it's 14, that's what Skip's letter states, and his certification as being 14 feet wide. Joe, can I just say something on that? Yeah. Um, in the packet, or in the submission under tab four, there's an aerial shot of the property. Um, which to me demonstrates that this isn't like stone wall or woods um, surrounding the area, that there's a lot of grass that's along this area. Um, so it kind of alleviates my concerns about the width of the road. Had it been like very thick brush that was made it a very narrow corridor, I'd be a little bit more concerned, but this is a very large, as I would describe it, a grass field. Um, on one side that I think if there was a situation that at least uh, emergency equipment could get through. But that's just me. Um, can I, I, I found your email, I, f I forgot that he had submitted something. His, his point actually is simply that one could get around where the turnout is. But my point is if a, if a truck gets stuck halfway down or some, something happens, something so, say there's a car that's broken down anyway an emergency vehicle needs to get around it, is that is that possible given the current? They could pull off this side over in here if they had to, because that the fill area on this side is relatively. It's not a two percent cross slope, mm -hmm. but it's enough of a slope that if he had to pull around on that side, the piece of equipment they could do it. Okay. Do you want to do a second? Yes. Any other yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I will put a caveat on the sidewalk. I can't do it until the first week of October. Okay. I won't be here next week. Unless there's a big hurricane. <laughs> Unless there's a big hurricane. Let's hope not. <laughs> Can you do it October 1st? See it again. October 1st. Tuesday? Yep. Yeah. Tuesday, October 1st. Do you, does the board want to do another 6 p.m.? Oh, yeah, before we come here. Yeah. 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 What Good idea. 6 p.m. on October 1st? Sure. That's the it same night as the planning board workshop. Be at that time. Okay. okay. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Yeah, it's getting dark a little yeah. earlier now, isn't it? <laughs> I can find 
find so. out. I can find that out for you too. When the alarm goes off at five o'clock and it looks like it's midnight, that's. Okay, oh, so one thing. Jonathan. Uh, Bob, with regards to that letter, I don't know if you had an opportunity to review it, but I just would hope that some I of the things. I have not seen it. Okay, d d there's. Um, suggestions that there's some inadequacies with regards to what's being proposed and what's actually um, in the plan and what's also might be involved in this litigation. So um, maybe if the application can clear up some of those concerns, mm -hmm. uh, the board might have an easier time um, looking at the approval and trying to stay out of that litigation that's been going on. Maureen, I assume you have that letter? Oh yes. Jonathan's return for it. Yeah, I got it from her. So. Yeah, I will. Um, I will make sure you get it. Okay. Thank you. Um, the sunset on October first is supposed to be six twenty-two. So. Well, it's not dark. It's. No, I mean that should be enough time. It should be fine. Yeah. Bring flash. We all have phones. <laughs> we can turn our phone lights on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, would anybody like to make a motion to table? I will. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of David Smith for a private road review of a portion of Cunner Lane located on the south side of 19 Cunner Lane be tabled to the October 15 meeting of the um, planning board at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. All right, Maureen, before I push something for. Don't worry about it. I've already taken the, the flash drive out. Thank you, John. I just want to get anything in front of it. Thank you. Okay, next item. The Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan to place a seven foot by 12 foot garden shed at the Pond Cove Elementary School located at 12 Scott Dyer Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19.9 site plan regulations. So are you here to, yes, you're here to speak. Please introduce yourself. Sashi Meisner, landscape architect here on behalf of the Town of Cape Elizabeth School Department to uh, ask the board to approve an amendment to the site plan that was approved in 2004 for the uh, Pond Cove Elementary School. They would like to add a shed to their playground, seven foot by 12 foot within the existing playground area that is referred to as nature land. This is an outdoor classroom space. The shed will be is a wood shed and it will be used for storage of classroom materials, things like uh, binoculars and magnifying glasses and things that the teachers would like to use with the children out in the outdoor uh, playground area. The, um, the shed is approximately seven feet high. It's made of wood. You have a picture of what it is in the application. It's kind of like a little, little hobbit house. Um, it will be set on a, just a stone uh, a pad, so nothing, uh, no below ground infrastructure for it. It will have just a, some concrete blocks on the stone base. In regards to the standards, this is pretty minor, uh, minor um, addition to the playground. So there's no um, grading issues that will have to take place. It's pretty much being set on a, a level area. 
the, um, there's no traffic involved with this, there's no parking, uh, there's an existing road uh, that accesses around the school that can be used, but uh, there's no additional parking or anything required. The stormwater is minimal, uh, there won't be anything. It's 84 square feet of impervious added to the site. Uh, same with erosion control, we're not anticipating uh, any erosion during construction. There's no utilities proposed to the shed, no signage, uh, no noise, no additional noise anticipated on the site in the playground. Uh, landscaping is not being changed. There's no exterior so storage. This will be used for storage, so we're not anticipating anything uh, needing to be stored outside of the shed. And that the town has um, submitted their financial capacity to purchase the shed. I'm okay. upset. Any questions? This, this is an easy one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. The meeting is now open to a public hearing on the issue of completeness. Seeing no one here to speak, the public hearing is closed. Um, any questions or comments on the issue of completeness? Anybody want to make a motion? I have a motion. <laughs> motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to the previously approved site plan to install a seven uh, foot by 12 foot wood shed on the Pond Cove Elementary School playground located at 12 Scott Dyer Road be deemed complete. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Motion passes. Okay. Um, any? I, I don't have any concerns about the construction either. So. Yeah, do I? Questions, comments? It seems like a minimal project with a big impact. <laughs> Looks <laughs> nice. Okay, so once again. Ooh, I have a motion meetings. for an approval. Hold on. The <laughs> meeting's open to a public hearing. <laughs> Seeing no one here, public hearing is closed. Okay. Motion. We don't need a site visit, right? I've got a motion for approval. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Findings of fact. Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan to install a 7 by 12 foot woodshed on the Pond Cove Elementary School playground located at 12 Scott Dyer Road, which requires review under section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two. The application substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to the, amendment to the previously approved site plan to install a 7-foot by 12-foot woodshed on the Pond Cove Elementary School playground located at 12 Scott Dyer Road be approved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? All opposed? Unanimous? Just for the record, I could have read that quicker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Planning board humor. Thank you. Thank you for sitting through the rest of the Yeah. We need your name. What is? I have it. Hiromi. Oh, okay. I have it. I have it. She has your name. What time? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I move we adjourn. <laughs> Wait, does anybody have any other business? You couldn't have said it faster than that. <laughs> okay. Can you make your motion? I move we adjourn. Second. <laughs> All in favor? 